Hi, it's Phil from the Humans Connecting team. We're really glad that you're here and we have some important messages for you before we start this episode. We recognize that it could have taken courage for you to press play on this content and we want to celebrate your courage because that type of courage is what's needed to help you get the connection that you're seeking. We're proud of you and we hope that you're just a little bit proud of yourself too. Our podcast is all about serving you, supporting you, challenging you, and inspiring you to become a connected human. And the content of our podcast is of a general nature. It's important that you understand that listening to or watching this content is not the same as seeking individual advice from a registered mental health professional or a coach. And conversations about human connection address loneliness. And we destigmatize loneliness here at Humans Connecting. And we do that by talking about loneliness openly. Loneliness conversations necessarily include a range of topics, which at times may be difficult for us to talk about and to hear. If throughout our conversation, this is true for you, we encourage you to please contact your local mental health hotline. And there's a link in the episode description that can help you find some immediate support for many places that you may be in the world. Simply, our advice to you right now is to meet yourself where you are. And if you don't feel up to it, that's okay. We'll be right here when you're ready. We're so glad that you're here. Let's jump into the episode. Hello, it's Phil and welcome to the Humans Connecting Podcast. Right, it's time to get things started. I'm Phil McAuliffe, and I'm a global loneliness thought leader. And when I'm not hosting this podcast, I'm a speaker, an author, a mentor, and a human who is endlessly curious about humans and the human condition. And part of that human condition is loneliness. And I got curious about the loneliness I experienced as I was entering middle age. And I've been working on understanding loneliness and the human condition since 2018. And I've founded Humans Connecting for two reasons. The first is to destigmatize loneliness and to help you wherever you are in the world and however you identify as a human to get the connection that you need and absolutely deserve. And this, my friend, is the first episode of our podcast. So let's start with a question. Do you also find getting something new started just a bit awkward and weird? Well, we do too. (laughs) We certainly do. And this episode of our podcast, this first episode of this podcast is one of those really weird situations. Firstly, we really wanted to get this podcast right. And this podcast is all about helping you become a connected human. And we all know that feeling when we don't feel connection Well, we know that that feeling is called loneliness, and we know that that feeling is absolutely awful. We also know that that connection is the antidote to loneliness. So the question is, though, if we know the answer to loneliness is connection, why is doing connection so hard sometimes? We want this podcast to be the place where you come to get the support and inspiration that you need to get the connection that you need and deserve. Sometimes that support and inspiration will be in the form of loving encouragement. And other times, well, it'll be a loving kick in the ass because that's what doing connection sometimes needs. It needs that loving kind words and and encouragement. And sometimes it does need, well, a kick in the ass. Either way, we're going to be right here by your side as you do connection. So how do we like possibly capture this 
in the first episode. How do we let you know that we're going to be right here beside you to get the connection that you need and deserve and help you go about getting that connection? One thing that I really didn't want to do was to drone on and on and essentially talk to myself about what we're doing here and answering questions that I think that you would want to ask me if we were here together. And I could tell you how I came to be the founder of Humans Connecting and what we're working towards. But, you know, if I'm honest, that felt like it, it would have had all the pizzazz of a budget meeting on a Friday afternoon before a long weekend. So the team came to the rescue and Pete, who you'll be meeting in a moment, agreed to host this episode and interview me with questions provided to Pete by the Humans Connecting team. And Pete asked them, of me. So, and I knew Pete was going to ask me questions, but I didn't know what the questions were. And so the answers that you're about to hear are unfiltered and unscripted. So get ready to hear some of my story of loneliness, the intentions for our work here at Humans Connecting, and how we are going to be right beside you as you go about getting the connection that you need. Yep, you deserve. But before we jump into the chat, we have one request of you. Sharing this episode with a friend is one way that you can support this podcast without cost. Another way, if you're so inclined, is to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Both things take a mere moment, are free to do, and really support us as we create our social impact enterprise that will change the world. Okay, enough of this intro. Let's jump into the episode. Pete Newsom, I'm in your hands. Beautiful. Well, that's a, a very brave thing to, <laughs> to do. Um, and I'm very grateful for it as well. So thank you for thank you for entrusting me with this with this podcast, Phil. Now, there's a there's a few things I would like mm. to uh, I would like to discover. But before we get into that, my name is Peter Newsom, and uh, I'm the uh, I head up the marketing team here at Humans Connecting, and I've been uh, very grateful and very fortunate uh, to have worked with Phil for uh, for for a few years now. Uh, outside of this this business, uh, in some of the uh, the work that Phil has done, and uh, and now we've uh, we've joined forces and uh, and are, are working on humans connecting together, and and it's it's a real honour to be part of the part of the team uh, with Phil. So uh, that's why I'm here, and uh, and thought it would be a a fun experiment to get to know Phil a little bit better, and uh, <laughs> and interview the the host of a podcast uh so that uh, we can we can explore explore who phil mcauliffe is and uh and why humans connecting uh, exists so i think that's a that's a really good way of starting the conversation so you know you've given us a little taste as to who phil mcauliffe is and some of the listeners may know you from uh, your previous podcasts or some of the work that you've done uh, mm. but for those that don't know um who is Phil McAuliffe? Mm. <clears throat> Pete, uh, I, I have to say before we we start off, um, uh, that's possibly the most serious that I've heard you speak in quite a while. Um, I was like, oh, oh, suddenly, suddenly there's like professional voice on. Um, it's uh, it's it's I'm here for it. It's awesome. Thank you. Um, yes. Who am I? Um, well, I can say now that I'm me and uh, I am me as I am in this moment, which I appreciate is an answer, but potentially not really an answer. It's kind of one of the, you know, some, some Instagram philosophy answer, but I can say now that it's taken, it took a very long time for me to be able to go, here I am, I'm Phil. 
Um, I'm awesome. I'm a work in progress. I, you know, I'm deeply curious. Uh, I'm deeply curious about the human condition. Um, I, you know, ever since I was a kid, we just vacuum up information and facts. And, you know, I was the kid who read encyclopedias and, um, uh, uh, and, and poured over atlases. Um, and I'm kind of just this creature who is deeply fascinated by how things work. And I'm realizing now seeing connections. So seeing, seeing opportunities, seeing, um, how things could possibly be. Um, so yeah, I think without wanting to be too frustrating an answer, I want to say that it has taken me a very long time to be comfortable with me, within me, um, because there are some things that are walking contradictions <laughs> about myself. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm me. And me also includes I'm a dad. Uh, I'm a partner uh, to my awesome partner, Jeff. And I live in Canberra. I've been based here, um, what is it? Yeah, so now 25 years being based in, in Canberra. Um, and from a small country town in regional New South Wales here in Australia um, of about 800 people. Uh, went to uni in Melbourne uh, and I have been traveling and living overseas in many parts of the world for the last 20 years uh, while based um, here. Um, yeah, so it, it's all kind of fed that deep curiosity um, and me pulling a thread ages ago, it seems ages ago, has led me to this moment uh, speaking to you, Pete, uh, and to the listener and the, and the viewer um, about me and who I am and what brought me here. I love that. And in regards to, in regards to that, that first curiosity uh, mm. that showed up and of all the, the different, the different human conditions mm. uh, that you could dive into and, and decide <laughs> that, that you want to destigmatize or tackle, uh, mm. what was it about loneliness that, uh, that stood out or even before we get into what was it yeah. about loneliness, uh, what was the first experience where you actually identified with that sense of, of loneliness and realize that okay well I can do something about this because yeah. I, I think that it's quite common for people to first of all perhaps not be aware of their loneliness and I, I'd mm. like to explore that a little bit further but yeah uh, you know what brought you to that awareness and um and then what inspired you to then want to do something um so big about destigmatizing um this this human condition mm -hmm. that we all, we all have yeah i i want to say right from the start that i desperately did not want to be lonely desperately did not want to be lonely and i recall um well, at the time, I was living and working in Seoul, South Korea, uh, as an Australian diplomat. And it was the third time that uh, that we uh, uh, had been living and working overseas. Um, and, you know, the kids were doing great at school. My then wife was, you know, like we were loving living where we were and, and doing what we did. But there was this... I want to say feeling within me, but it was almost, you could describe it, I, I'll describe it as the lack of feeling, it was the absence of feeling that I first noticed. And that absence of, of feeling, I, I sort of, I describe it as a void. Um, and that void had been there for a little while, but 
over the the sort of years previous, I would go, oh, like I, just, I need to work harder. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll work harder. I'll, I don't know, get a posting or a promotion or, or, you know, showcase my awesomeness and, and, and get recognition that way. But that became harder and harder to do and that void became harder and harder to ignore. And that sort of void would 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 show up and I would be terrified of falling into it. Because I didn't know what it was, but I knew, not knew, but I suspected that if I fell into it, I don't know what would happen on the other side of that. And I recall, and, and you know, Pete, you know this from, from our conversations over the past few years and listener uh, and viewer, you and I will get very familiar, um, I'm sure, over the, the, the years um, about the power of language. And for me, the power, like there was, um, I remember sort of saying to myself, willing myself, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I should be happy got a great job of, you know, live in a lovely apartment. I get like wonderful opportunities. There's, you know, I get to do this for my country. I like get to do it again for my country. And it's like all of these things that are going great in, in life. I should be happy. Why aren't okay. I happy? And, you know, I, I double down on, on, you know, work, working out, um, all the, the things, like I, I just like, you know, or maybe if I did it this time, maybe if I put my tongue on the left side of my mouth this time while doing it, that's going to be the secret. So maybe if I read this book, you know, um, maybe if I did this or that or, you know, practice the subtle art of not giving a fuck or whatever it was, like, you know, maybe that's that was going to be the key. And, yeah, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. And then I read something and I still remember this. I, for some reason, I opened the Boston Globe on my, um, on my tablet and I was just kind of flicking through the Boston Globe and there was a, like a, a link saying, you know, something about middle-aged men. And um, I started reading it and it was written by a journalist at the Boston Globe. And this was in 2016. And so I was just about to turn 40 and I'm like, I kind of need to accept the fact that I'm getting into middle age here. And I read it and I thought, shit, like that's me. Save, like swap out a bit of context, but the thoughts and feelings that the journalist was describing about how he was, what he was thinking and what he was feeling the presence of friends, but the absence of people who knew him. Um, and I'm like, oh my God, that's that's me. And then I, I still remember Pete. I still remember this absolutely distinctly like that. The falling in my stomach, like my guts dropped. It's like, shit, I'm lonely. And I remember going, oh, crap, like, okay, what do I do with this? I'm like, oh, I, am I sure? Am I sure it's loneliness? Am I sure it's loneliness? Because, you know, I'm generally kind of happy. Apart from like this existential void that I was feeling, I'm generally happy. <laughs> like, um, And, you know, the, the, I was, I'm, I'm the guy who, you know, quick with a, a joke. Sometimes they're not good jokes. Um, but, you know, quick with a joke, the, the, the quip, the pun, like I'm all over that. And, you know, the, the hail fellow well met, like smile on my face, you know, cross you in the corridor at work. Hey, how you going? Yeah, going really well. Like I was always great. And I remember like entering into that bargaining stage. It's like, no, I can't be lonely. Maybe, maybe I'm anxious. So I did that sort of scan, maybe Googled anxiety. That's not here. Like, oh, maybe it's well, depression. I'm almost getting that it almost feels like you started going through um, 
almost the stages of grieving when coming mm. to terms with this this experience of loneliness. Yeah. That's very true. That's very true. And it's almost, yep, a grief because loneliness and lonely people seem so sad, needy, clingy, and basically I, I've now got a whole lot of words to describe this because I'm, you know, um, I'm sure we'll get into this in a moment, but like it's like it seems so broken. And I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm and there's afraid. no pill to fix it. There's that, that that was the thing. That's the critical thing here. There's no pill to fix it. But if I was anxious or depressed, like I could have taken anti-anxiety or anti-depression, uh, like anti-depress, like antidepressants. Um, and yeah, but there's no like anti-loneliness pill. And then I looked around and all the advice. There was nothing that really spoke to me. And it was all about like advice for the bereaved or the elderly, like when we kind of expected to feel lonely. And that's like, what's going on? Like this, this is like, this is not, this is not right. And then like a couple of things happened and here we are. <laughs> like, it's not right. It's, I find that really interesting, as you're saying, that it's almost like the elderly, it's acceptable, almost, or it's understood that, well, when people get older, you know, that's, that's okay to feel lonely, like, you know, they're, they're allowed to feel lonely, because of whatever conditions or whatever it is, whatever story we have about, about what it must be like um, yeah. to grow old, but mm. that language, it's, I find it interesting that that language seems to not apply to people, like you said, in middle age, and and I'm imagining, um, you know, younger generations as well, um, yeah. experiencing that and not knowing, you know, how to identify with it because it's it's a term that gets lumped in with with the elderly, or like you were saying, it gets lumped in with types of perhaps mental illness or or yeah. other chat that we we do have language to talk about, you know, with are you okay day, you know, we've had people asking, are you okay? But it's not as common, at least from what I've seen for people to, to have conversations about loneliness. No. Uh, can you, can you talk a little bit more about, um, about that and what mm. you found from having conversations and starting to explore this loneliness um, or the topic of loneliness with people? Yeah. One one thing that I noticed, um, you know, I got I got help, I got support. Um, G'day, Mike. Uh, I know you're going to be listening because I'm going to nag you to listen to it, uh, and Pete will too. So, for for reference, viewer and listener, uh, Mike Campbell. Um, I work with Mike, um, and so does Pete. He does some some work with uh, with Mike, but uh, he's been my coach, and um, uh, and also Pete, uh, yours as well. Um, so yeah, Mike sort of, Mike gave me me back. He gave me skills and like the, the awareness within me that began to get me back. Like that plus me doing some really heavy lifting and, and internal kind of soul searching, which at times seemed a joy. And then other times I'm like, oof, this is tough. Um, but one of the things that I began to realize as I was doing the work within myself, I began to realize that there were other people like me in almost exactly the same situation that I was in, seemingly having the same challenges that I was or I, I had had and was working through. And so I began essentially coming out as lonely to people. And so I would reach out and that's a very business world, isn't it? I, 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 I getting like, I, I get my time, like, let's go and get a coffee. And we may have, um, you know, like talk about the weather or work or whatever for a little while. And they'd be like, okay, like, how are you going? And for, for, you know, the viewer and, and listener who is not in Australia or not in New Zealand or not in the UK, 
Um, how you going is a greeting. And oftentimes we, we, you know, we don't really want to know how you're going beyond going well. But when it's asked like as the third question or it's prefaced with something like, so how are you going? Like that's the, that's the invitation for things to get real. And rather than going, no, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. I actually started to accept that invitation, which, accept, which felt very edgy. And, you know, I don't know how this is going to go. But I ended up like going, yeah, actually, I've been, you know, doing this program and, you know, I, I, I started it because I was lonely. And almost without exception, would go quiet. And I hated the quiet. It's like those three dots when you're, when you're texting and you're just like, oh, God, oh, God. It's like, you know, do you feel... It's been nice, but you're a fundamentally broken human being. Um, no thanks. Uh, but almost without exception, almost without exception, met with me too, or a variation of me too. And yeah, like the idea was born. But one of the things, uh, and, and so after a while, I, I started, you know, I wrote a book, a blog for The Lonely Diplomat and created The Lonely Diplomat and podcast and, and all that kind of stuff for people like me. Um, but one of the things that I found talking about loneliness is that we don't talk about loneliness. And I think it's an irony and not in a good way, not a good irony that we can talk about depression. We could talk about anxiety. We can talk about, in a way, we do it very carefully and respectfully, but suicide um, and, you know, other kind of issues that affect our mental and emotional and physical well-being. We're getting better as a society to do that. But what we know about loneliness, first of all, loneliness is not a mental health condition. It is not. And treating it as such, I think, does a disservice. But loneliness left untended and left unaddressed has a very high likelihood of turning into anxiety or depression. It affects our cardiovascular system, so it puts us at higher risk of heart disease, stroke, heart attack, some, kind of can some types of cancers, diabetes, and at this point, I'd be going, yes, you know, it's as, it's as bad for you as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, which is what everyone says. And it is. It's bad for you. It's really bad. Loneliness kills us. Why is it that we can talk about loneliness, we can talk about anxiety and depression, checking in with people, normalizing conversations about mental health in our workplaces? Why is it that we cannot yet talk about a significant factor into why we are feeling depressed, why we feel, why we feel anxious. You know, not everything about our heart health means that, you know, you need to be able to, 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 to run a couple of kilometers every day to, you know, keep your heart healthy. It's like, actually the quality of your connections really, really, really matters really matters. Maybe not at the time, but over time. Why is it that we can't talk about the reason why? That to me, after spending years in the Australian public service, including serving overseas as an Australian diplomat, where everything needed to be phrased just so, for good reason, but also sometimes not for good reason. Not talking about something doesn't serve us all the time. Doesn't make it go away. Doesn't make it like better. No, when, it, we, when it's about loneliness, when we don't talk about it, when inevitably we experience loneliness because we all do from time to time. We're meant to. When it does, when we are affected by it, when we have a loneliness experience, 
Like we think that we're all alone because no one talks about it. No one talks about it. I'm tired of that. Tired of that. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Pussyfooting around it doesn't work. Caching it in only in statistical terms doesn't work. Or doesn't go the whole way. So I, I like that you mentioned um, the statistics there and, and there is a lot of literature and mm. there, there's a lot of statistics and um, academia has spoken about loneliness. It is, it is a topic that I think since uh, the pandemic, uh, mm. it has been a lot more topical for people to start exploring. Um, yeah. some, so there is, there is a little bit of information floating around out there now mm. uh, that discusses loneliness, but what makes... Mm. What makes the work that you're doing, I suppose, different to, to what's being talked about um, out there and, and what makes it different to all the, just the stats and figures and, and the yeah. data that, that's there? Yeah, yeah. Um, the work that we're doing, Pete. Um, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> but one thing is the stats, the stats, the data, um, they're great. They're great to start a conversation. They're a great way of starting a conversation and, and helping. I mean, I've, you know, I've got a public policy background, uh, like public policy academic background and a professional background in public policy. Stats are what get attention. Because every topic, when you're in working government, everything is important but you need to be able to prioritise because there's not enough time or money or people or whatever to, to, to devote to every problem, to fix every problem. The stats and the data helps focus available resources on the issue. And, you know, within my own career, like, you know, when you were trying to make, make a point, you'd always try to find the statistic, the equivalent of 15 cigarettes a day. Right. You'd always be trying to find the statistic that would make your boss's jaw drop or the minister's jaw drop and go, you know, holy shit, this is a terrible thing. We need to get on this. And then, you know, that, that statistic became like the thing that was mentioned in media releases and speeches in parliament or speeches to, you know, lunch events or, 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 or whatever, like the National Press Club or something like that. You'd always be looking for that. The issue is when it comes to something like loneliness, we need to take steps to move the conversation about loneliness and statistics into where loneliness is experienced. And loneliness is experienced in the hearts, minds and souls of humans. It's not experienced and ends in media reports, academic reports, statistics, it's a great start. But what I see our role, part of our role here, and there's, there's quite a few that I can see that I see for us, but it's essentially helping humans become loneliness literate and helping or putting humans, keeping humans at the centre of our collective response to loneliness. And we do that by researching it, but also we do it by not researching it and being human and talking about it. And this is said so many times, and I love it. We don't connect to statistics. We don't connect through well-mounted theses, like well-researched and well-annotated theses and stuff. Frustratingly, because <laughs> I've written a few in the time. But we connect through stories. And we all every single human, however we identify as a human, we all have a story of loneliness. 
because it's something, it's an experience that we all have and we've been to. I like the the destigmatizing of loneliness, and I uh, I like that in this conversation that we're having, you're talking about loneliness being an experience that not only that we all have, um, but it's it's important for us all to have it um, mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. often I think that some of the um, the discussions around it are things around you know how do we end loneliness and it's I don't think it's about bringing an end to anything I think it's like you said it's it's about creating those discussions it's about bringing out those stories and and mm. uh, and giving people that permission to be able to to express and explore those moments when they do have a loneliness experience mm. and be able to to relay that to someone else and have that other person be able to then hold that without the fear of like you talked about earlier if i if i listen to this person maybe i'll fall into that hole as well maybe there's there's something that i you know i don't know if i have the capacity or the space to be able to hold this mm. so i i like i like that perspective yeah to me thank you it is um i say this a lot because it it lands it kind of simplifies the complex but in many ways it simplifies the simple right so loneliness is as elemental to our survival as a human a functioning human as hunger and thirst now i would love to take credit for this I would love to take credit for this, but this comes from um, the late Dr. John Cacioppo, and I really hope I'm pronouncing uh, his, his surname right. But he was, you know, a, a pioneer in, in um, loneliness studies, which pretty recent, like within, you know, the last sort of 20, 30 years. But one thing here is that like we need to remember like loneliness is as elemental to us humans as hunger and thirst and you know we we need however we identify as a human we need other humans we need to feel that we belong it's a non-negotiable and at this point i often hear oh i'm an introvert i don't need other people well, you could be an introvert. Absolutely. The world needs introverts. But you still need people. You just need them in a different, like in a different capacity to an extrovert. Right. So what I like at this, you know, just lost my train of thought. Uh, at, at, at this point. But remembering that it is as elemental as hunger and thirst is really important. So where we have hunger, which is an uncomfortable emotion, like an uncomfortable sensation, it's an uncomfortable sensation designed to get your attention so you go and eat something. Thirst, again, is an uncomfortable sensation that is meant to make you stop what you're doing and go get something to drink. Sorry, I'll stop speaking like, you know, a farmer. Get something to drink. Um, and um, this, and, and loneliness by, by that same logic is meant to make you stop what you're doing and get connection. Do connection. Actually go and verb connection. And what is it that you think makes it so elusive or difficult for us, first of all, to pay attention to that that reminder uh, that we, we need to go out and cultivate that connection, but also as we, as we get older and um, 
sometimes connection is something that happens as we're growing up um, through being put together as kids in, in a school or yeah. through a sporting club and, and connection seems to, to naturally form. Uh, whereas as, as we get older, uh, I've often heard people talk about how difficult it is to, to make new friends or to, mm. to form those connections. So we've got this, as you talk about this indicator inside, just like um, that feeling of uh, of hunger or thirst, but often we don't realise that that's an invitation to to find connection when we have mm. that that experience or that feeling of loneliness. But then there's also those challenges of how do we actually go out and and create that connection, and why is that so so difficult um, as we get older? Yeah. Um... That's a brilliant question. I love it. Um, and uh, don't look now, but uh, we're going to be, you know, exploring that in 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 many future episodes of of the, the the podcast. But without doubt, and I'm trying to find like the answer here, Pete and viewer and listener. I'm trying to find the answer because I know we've all got pens poised and we want to know what the answer is. Right now. For me, I think the answer is we're just so busy. We're consumed with our own busyness that we forget to stop, to just do what you did there, Pete, to stop, and what I just did, stop and have a drink of water. So we're consumed with doing, with achieving, with all of the sort of flow on things that come from, you know, uh, a living and, and working in a society that praises and values productivity. And very quickly, speaking as someone who did this and still has a tendency to do it myself. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, like, let us not cast stones. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think... Um, like we, we, we celebrate busyness, but that comes at a cost. Sure, you might achieve stuff. You might sort of do stuff, but that comes at a cost as us, of us being humans. And it can be really hard when we have lost, potentially have lost or conflated our sense of worth and worthiness with our economic worth. Now, I'm going to just say something here. It drives me crazy when I hear people in government talking about how we need to, you know, do something to build our economy better. But, yep, that might be true from an economic perspective. But we don't live in an economy. We live in a society. And when we treat humans sounds very most capitalist of me but when when you know we treat humans as nothing more or very little more than rational economic beings we begin to lose people and you know we we have to work so hard to keep a roof over our head we have to work so hard to put petrol in the car, we have to work so hard to educate kids, we have to work so hard to do anything. And we might get there. We might free ourselves of that, but that comes at a cost. And that cost is actually us having space and time to connect with ourselves to know who we are and be who we are. It's one thing to know who you are. Pete, you and I have had many long conversations about this. It's one thing to know who you are. That's almost the easy bit. Well, it's easier than being who you are. Because the being is where the uncomfortable conversation happens or the discomfort of like, what will they think happens? 
And so there's this tension of like, I want to be me, but I've got to like keep the lights on and warm and, you know, like not be homeless. And so, yeah, that this comes at a cost. There's benefits, but there's costs. And I feel that the costs are being borne by humans who simply don't have time to do connection. Connection is one of the first, like first things that's jettisoned, like connection to self, connection to those most important to us and connection to community. It's one of the first things that's jettisoned when we're busy. It's like, I'll just like work later and get up early. Human, you need sleep. <laughs> you need sleep. And trust me, if it worked, I would have like nailed it years ago. Right? <laughs> um, but yeah, like this is like, I think what we're experiencing now has been there for a while, but the pandemic in many ways caught us where we were at that time. And that was potentially in our hamster wheel. And then we realized like, why, why are we running? Why are we running like this, this? Like the world could turn on its head within a few days. What, what am I doing this for? And so I, I think that there's a way, there's a way that we can do this. We can do this life while still making a contribution and allowing us humans to be human. That's, I'm not even sure that I answered your question there, Pete. You've got to rein me in, I think. Okay, well, I think with that one there, there's a few things that's definitely coming to me and, and there's a point that I also want to touch on um, that you spoke of, but uh, it speaks to that idea of us um, being human beings as opposed to human doings. Yeah, uh, we often get caught up in that uh, in that state of doing. But it's it's interesting because I know that also from the the research into into loneliness, and one of the things that can get in the way of connection because of you know potentially shame, guilt. Um, or mm -hmm. even purely um, economic factors around financial stability, those that um, that are suffering from hardship or those that um, that are struggling financially uh, do find it more difficult to connect. So it's it's almost like there's this juxtaposition or you know between if I'm if I'm not working or if I'm if I'm not striving and earning, that mm. will impact my ability to be able to connect because I won't be able to go out for that coffee. I won't be able to afford to, to go yeah. and see, do something social because often there's the way that we connect with people is in an environment that has, you know, a, or it doesn't need to, but it can have, and, and often does have an economic um, element to it. So when we don't have those, those financial resources to help yeah. with that connection, it, it, can cause it. so to avoid that we work harder so that we can have the money to be able to do that and yet mm -hmm. that prevents us from them being able to form those meaningful connections because of that busyness yeah um, yeah can you can you talk a little bit more uh about that um you know and and as as humans what's uh what's a way to to potentially find that balance um I, in my head, I've got this, and you were talking about, you know, the the cost of of some of these these choices that we make. Uh, and in my head, I just went down this path of having like this cost benefit analysis going yeah. on. That's business brain yeah. work. Um, yeah. I, I find it really interesting. Um, you know, how how would we, or what ways um, could you suggest that we can we can balance that out, or what indicators? could we be looking at internally when when we might be working maybe too hard or when we're you know noticing those moments come up where 
we're resisting connecting because we don't feel that we have the means to be able to and yeah. what way around that so there's a yeah. few different questions i suppose in there you can take that whatever whatever way you would like but um, yeah. I'm, I'm 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 going to just pick one randomly but i wonder can i have a few moments to think about that while we hear from moana absolutely hey kilda it's mona from humans connecting here we're really glad that you're here i hope that you're getting something out of this and vibing with us if you're curious about what else we do, come check out our website, humansconnecting.org. We've got some products and services, including inclusion prompts to help you put your connection goals into action. Now back to the show. Thanks. So, yeah, I think with this, one thing that I find hopeful in all of this is that sometimes we we conflate doing connection with costing money. And, and 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 some of this has come from my lived experience over the last few years. So you know, I uh, my uh, ex wife and I we separated while we were living in New Zealand. And during that time, this is like late twenty nineteen, and into twenty twenty, you know, I moved out of the family home and in. January 2020, I moved into a, uh, if anyone else lives in Wellington, what, like, you know what I'm saying by, you know, it's a one, like a studio apartment um, that, uh, you know, was as damp as a creek running through it uh, and, uh, and stuff in central Wellington. But then COVID hit. And... Jeff and I were stuck in New Zealand and didn't know when the border back to Australia would open or Jeff could come to Australia and I'd be able to leave Australia to go back to New Zealand to spend time with the kids. And as a result, like, you know, just fast forwarding through some of the details here, but we became homeless. And money started to become really, really tight. And within myself, still, I might add, just to be very honest, money is uh, a source of like, I mean, life's easy when you've got it. Like there's a flow, there's an ease and stuff, and it's the absence of it or the constriction of it where you're like, is this going to be enough? Is this going to be enough? Now I'm within myself and, you know, with a whole lot of people, uh, you know, uh, in my corner now I'm working through this. But at the time, one of the standard things was to say, oh, before you go, like we should go and have coffee. Oh, we should go and have dinner. We should do this and we should do that. And, you know, like let's go out for a few drinks. Well, like in New Zealand, a beer costs like $15. Um, dinner, you don't get much change, sometimes even without alcohol for $100. And a coffee is $5.50. It's like that adds up as a way of catching up and like seeing people and, and, and stuff. Like it's lovely. Who doesn't want to have like, you know, a good, good chat. I'm all for the chats. I'm all for the chats over a coffee. I'm all for the chats over a beer. I'm all for the chats over, you know, whatever. Um, those chats couldn't happen. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't eat. And very quickly, I was sort of got to a point, and with Jeff's like love and support. It's like, all right, I'm going to have to actually essentially start going, like, can't afford it, saying we can't afford to do that. We'd love to. Oh, my God, we'd love to go to that restaurant that's, you know, one of the best places in town, like where all the cool kids go. But how about we go to the park? It's like, let's go and have a chat under the park, like, you know, under a tree in the park. 
And, you know, after say, can't afford it. And like the relief, the relief that came back is like, oh my God, I can't afford that. We end up maintaining this lifestyle. We can end up maintaining this lifestyle on credit. And so when times are tough, like the first thing that's jettisoned, as I've said before, is, is connection. We need to remember that connection doesn't cost anything. It needn't cost anything. And, you know, maybe, maybe it's time to, you know, normalize visiting people in their houses again. Putting on, you know, putting the kettle on and, and uh, you know, hopefully we don't get to the point where Nescafe, uh, like instant coffee, I should say, is, is, is acceptable. But, you know, if that's your thing, like all power to you. But, you know, something, something that's, um, you know, that we can do, still get that connection boost that we absolutely need and deserve as humans, doesn't need a three course dinner, doesn't need drive through, doesn't need a coffee, like, a sit down it helps but yeah i think knowing that the connection that we need needn't cost anything or could be done very minimally thanks thank you so much for um yeah the the courage and the vulnerability of, of sharing that i know that uh the talking about um, some of these times when they have been tough uh, is something that as humans we we tend to shy away from and, and we glorify the good times and mm -hmm. uh, and we don't talk about some of those those more challenging times so um, firstly just thank you so much for for sharing that and and I think that uh, one of the things I really liked about that story was that when you proposed options to to connect without the cost involved there was that sense of relief that sense of yeah. relief that you felt. but also it's what i heard from that was it may have also been a relief for others as well to go oh well i don't have to we don't have to spend money um and i i think that that's a that's a really really powerful thing that um uh, and a, a lesson that I think that we all could um, yeah, take on board for sure. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it, it's it's <clears throat> it's always a tough moment to be vulnerable, whatever that looks like. And vulnerability can be big, like life changing vulnerability, like saying I'm gay. I'm lonely. They're big kind of things that risk people changing their perceptions of us, judging us. But the more we do it, the more comfortable we become with it. Notice that I said that it doesn't become easier. We just become more comfortable with it. And I feel it's really important and I'm really grateful that over time I've, I've developed that skill. Again, I know we connect through stories, but each and every time I share my story, it does take a level of like, a, I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know where this is going to go. They could be, you know, the listener or the viewer could be like, no, nah, like, fuck this shit. Like, what, what? Like, what's it going on about? Like, no, turn off. Generally, I mean, sometimes it happens. Sometimes it happens. But generally, people are like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And when we are brave and courageous 
and allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to admit that we don't all have our shit together. Like we start to create the environment for connection to happen. Now I've heard this say, said many times, but you know, we can't, we always, we always, but I'm going to personalize this. I just caught myself there, Pete. I spent such a long time in my life cultivating the image of perfection. The ability to say the right thing to the right person at the right time to affect the right outcome. Yeah, well, I nailed it. Yeah, absolutely. That was awesome. And I can still do it. Like, what a skill. But, but the cost was I was so caught up in doing things for other people, saying the right thing, doing the right thing, doing what I thought others expected of me. That there, was, there became a point where that didn't work. There was a me inside me, read me, that I denied for so long. The person who didn't have all this shit together. And the person who was pretending to not be gay. I mean, it's easy to like potentially look at that and go, oh, that was the big thing. Like he was wrestling with his sexuality. You know, it's part of it. That was part of the source of my loneliness. But much of it, like I think if we're going to qualify and quantify it, it was me showing up in the world as what I imagined everyone else expecting me to be. Instead of being me. And so any kind of vulnerability, any kind of, you know, putting yourself out there, even by saying, you know what, can't afford it. Can we go to the park instead? Can we go for a walk instead? Like that stuff, that's a valuable muscle to begin flexing if we don't know where to start. Because we humans can't connect with perfect. We can't connect with perfect, and um, but we spend so much time cultivating the illusion of perfection. And then, in my case, wonder why no one actually can see me. Why I didn't feel that anyone knew me. So, yeah, I'm not saying that everyone needs to start a podcast or create Humans Connecting or, you know, become the Lonely Diplomat or the Loneliness Guy or whatever it is um, and, and do kind of vulnerability writ large. But someone, somewhere, hopefully even ourselves, like we can allow ourselves to be vulnerable with ourselves. That seems like a pretty good place to start. Not an easy place to start, but a pretty good place to start. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a that's a nice segue. So you've talked about uh you've talked about um the idea of of humans needing stories and as a way of connection. We've talked about the way of um finances not necessarily needing to get in the way of connection and, and mm -hmm. having that courage and that bravery to to be vulnerable and and connect and uh you know getting to identify that that sensation of loneliness mm -hmm. uh, and bring language to it so there's there's a, a number of different different ways you've talked about um loneliness here and and you've also talked about the uh i suppose the um i'm not going to say because we talked about this before so it's not the mm -hmm. the uh, cure to loneliness but one of the ways of addressing loneliness is through that sense of connection the connection to self the connection you know to community to to others to the things that uh that are most important to us yep 
I, I imagine that this is, uh, or I, I know, because mm-hmm. part of the, the team here and, and we spend a lot of time talking about this, but uh, for the listener, uh, can you tell me more about how these things come together uh, in humans connecting and the way that, that you bring some of these tools together um, to help people with their sense of connection? Yeah, very simply, we need to turn loneliness from a foe into a friend because it's, again, first hunger. It's our body's way. It's particularly shitty, Pete. <laughs> shitty way, let's let's say, curse you evolution and not doing like, like you know, I smell lavender. Um, I must be lonely. Like, um, no, like it's a particular, at times, horrible set of thoughts, feelings. It's a horrible experience. It's an uncomfortable experience, but it's the only way that our body tells us that we're missing some kind of connection that's important to us. And for me and for us, that's the big clue. Loneliness, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all glad at like, you know, on my soapbox here. So let's let's just strap in. But honestly, loneliness doesn't give a shit who you are, what you do for a living, where you live, your relationship status doesn't give a shit. Just like your hunger doesn't care who you are. Just like your thirst doesn't care who you are. Loneliness just simply doesn't care. And but we have this kind of misguided notion that something like a job will somehow make us immune to the human condition. No, it won't. And I had a pretty awesome job. And I actually believed that I was immune to the human condition because I was told that to do this job, you're like a special cut. You're different to other people. But no, 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 no. I've got skills, I've got all this kind of stuff, but I'm still fundamentally human. And knowing that loneliness is elemental, I haven't cured my thirst just because I drank water last week. I haven't cured hunger because I ate three weeks ago. Like, no, 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 I still need food. I still need water and I still need connection. That's the key, Pete. That's the key listener and viewer. It's becoming what I think we're going to be sort of terming loneliness literate. Knowing that loneliness's job is to try to get our attention by making us feel pretty shit. To stop and go, huh, what kind of connection am I missing? What connection is important to me? And then how can I, what, what, what am I missing of these like important things? What am I missing? Okay, how do I go about getting that connection? How do I go about doing that connection? That's what human connect, humans connecting is all about. Essentially, knowing, I, I, I saw this written in a book the other day, um, and I like it, so I'm going to use it. Loneliness is like comes in waves in life. And just like any wave, like it says me, I'm a country boy, and I, I'm giving a, 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 a like a beach analogy here. Like lived six hours drive from the nearest beach growing up. Like, but here we go. And you know, waves come in sets. Life events, things in life come in sets. When loneliness happens. Pretending that it's there is doesn't work. That it's that that you know that we're experiencing loneliness. Pretending that it, it it doesn't work. Like loneliness then overcomes us, but we pretend that it's not happening. Here, we want to use loneliness 
to and teach humans how to surf the waves of loneliness to get to a point on the beach where they like where they get the connection that they need they get the connection that they need they go back out they you know paddle in the water they surf some more of life they go oh there's loneliness again right let me read this wave what's this wave trying to tell me like i know that's kind of connection that i need how do i use my my skills and all that kind of stuff i think I think the people on the pod listening on the podcast should be very grateful that they can't see me acting this surfing out like people on YouTube can. But this is all about like we could call it teaching you to fish, all this kind of stuff. Like, and this is the thing that I've noticed about loneliness response. There's two things. One is how do we get you through the crisis? How do we get you through this loneliness moment that we then get you feeling connected? Has its purpose? Absolutely, absolutely has its purpose and it's very important. But what next? What comes after? What's next? And the other thing as well is that loneliness is so abhorrent to us. There's a very good reason why we keep loneliness and conversations about loneliness in the third person, loneliness is. And the second person, when you feel lonely or you're not alone, because to allow loneliness to be in the first person, my loneliness, I experience loneliness when. That is Ah, and we know it's tough. It's tough for us too. So rather than sit with that tough, sometimes the conversation turns into connection. We all want this, the cure, but not the cause. The cure though, cure. The solution, using my words better there, the solution is in the loneliness for each and every one of us. Because Pete, when you experience loneliness, it's a unique blend of herbs and spices that you that have culminated in you. Same with me. Same with you, listener and viewer. And it requires a unique bespoke response. Like, Get through the moment. Absolutely. Absolutely get through the tough moment because loneliness can make us think some pretty horrible thoughts and feelings. And if this is you now, having pressed play on this and you're wondering when we get to the answer, like, and you're in crisis right now, please, please go and seek some support. And there's a link in the episode description for going and getting some crisis support where you are in the world. And you're absolutely worthy of that. There is no like, you know, I'll wait till it gets better. Don't do it. Get through this moment. Go and get the support that you so freely recommend other people to get. But please come back to us because we want you to have that kind of ease and confidence that comes from like, I know that this is happening. I accept that this is happening. And we're going to like surf this wave to get the connect. We're going to listen to it. We're going to like watch what the, you know, like, oh, this is a doozy. It looks like it's going to be a dumper. And have to shoot the barrel, whatever it is. I'm just going to stop insulting all of our intelligences here. Um, but yeah, like I, I've got this. I've got this. That's what we're here for at Humans Connecting. That's what we're here for. Because the connection that you need and deserve, it's in the loneliness that you're experiencing. And your loneliness doesn't make you broken, doesn't make you 
unworthy of love and belonging. It makes you beautifully fucking human. And I'm totally here, Pete. I'm not going to paraphrase. I'm not going to put your words in your mouth, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion that this is true. And I know this for, for all the team here at Humans Connecting. We are here for the humans because we're fucking humans too. Just making it, like, happen. Oh, I, I wholeheartedly concur. Absolutely. You know, we're here for you. We're here for us. We're here for each other. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's not a ride at Disneyland. It's not something that you go, ah. But I promise you, I promise you, because I've tried this for so many years, that ignoring your loneliness, wishing it away, pretending it's not there, denying it, kind of taking a, like, oh, I'll just deal with this little bit here, it doesn't work. Might work for a little bit. Might get some relief. But, oh, my God, do we want you to thrive as a human? Thrive because you've experienced loneliness, not in spite of your loneliness. That's what we're here for. That's beautifully yes. said. Beautifully yes. said. So that's what human connecting is doing. And some of the ways that you go about cultivating that connection. Um, where where do you see things moving in the future for for humans connecting and and for connection as as a whole, really? Yeah, I think connection as a whole, <laughs> ironically, like the whole thing is an easier answer uh, than you know the direction for for humans connecting. But I want us to play a fundamental role in helping humans have the courage and the confidence and the language to talk about their loneliness and to receive stories of other people's loneliness without meeting it with pity, without meeting it with judgment, without meeting it with trying to fix it, but to allow it to be and respond with empathy. That's that's the end goal that we can talk about, like, oh, I'm experiencing loneliness with the same ease of like, you know, I'm a bit hungry. Let's go get something to eat. Like with that same like ease and 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 like lack of judgment. It's like, really? You're hungry again? Didn't we just eat dinner three weeks ago? Really? Right. That's the that's the big end goal. We here at Humans Connecting are here for that, to help make that happen, to play our part, to make that happen. Now we've got products and services that begin to make that happen. That, you know, um, speak to individual humans, workplaces, do this in the media, public speaking, all these kind of wonderful products and services that we've developed and will continue to develop. But honestly, and this would have terrified me a while ago, like, like 10 years ago, this, this answer would have terrified me. But now I'm totally here for it. I don't know exactly where this is going. except we're going to be keeping on working every day until we get to that ease of ease of, of, of the allowance of loneliness. That's a terrible way of putting it. But sitting with loneliness and accepting our loneliness with ease, comfort, possibly even welcoming. So we've given it like, we're on our way. We're on our way, including here in this podcast. And then in regards to the podcast, um, where do you see the uh, the future or what might be coming up on uh, on the podcast as, as this continues to evolve as well? 
Yeah, yeah. I did hear something the other day. And I think I said this to you, Pete, but I did hear on a on the like Tim Ferriss being interviewed on the Daily Stoic podcast. And it came at a time when I was like, you know, thinking about the podcast and you know, there was there's always going to be a podcast. But anyone who's done anything will go, yeah, there's the idea, like the idea is great. And then you're just like, shit, now I have to do it. <clears throat> and suddenly it feels like I'm at the base of a cliff looking up. <gasps> and Tim Ferriss said something which really struck with me. It's like, run the experiment. Run the experiment. So what we're doing in that nature is um, like practically we'll be doing 10 episode seasons. So it'll be like 10 weeks, an episode a week. And then we'll pause, reflect, do some stuff, see what's worked, what's not working, what feedback's been, what questions are, and then come back with the next season a little while later for another 10 episodes. Reflect, review, adjust. Because the temptation is, is like, it's got to be right the first time. No. But what we're going to be doing, though, during that time, there's going to be sort of a mix of episodes. There's going to be conversations, like, within our team, recording episodes, like, with our, you know, within our team, and because we have the most awesome chats. There's going to be some solo episodes with me where I'll be calling you forward, I'll be calling you out, I'll be sharing some of my experience. And we'll also be talking with other human connection experts, academics, public policy experts, all people who are working from their perspective, from their skills and experience and areas of expertise to solve this loneliness problem all over the world. And we'll be getting them on here, having a chat with them and turning their wisdom, turning their, their knowledge into something that you can do. Because it's the doing, it's the doing. And I say this all the time. Knowing about loneliness, knowing how bad it is, how many people have it, which is everyone, but how many people like really have it or like where they are or what they've had for, you know, whatever, whatever. That's great. But the risk is that until we do something within ourselves to do connection, to start getting connection, the risk is we simply become well-informed about the importance of connection and lonely. Connection requires us to do, and the whole purpose of us here is to go, okay, we know that, we know that loneliness is bad for us. We know. We know that it's bad for us. It feels horrible. It kills us. But, oh, my God, why is it so hard to do connection sometimes? That's what we're here for. So you can actually get the connection that you need. That's where the podcast is going to go. Beautiful. And on that note around um, something actionable, just before we, before we wrap up, what is one actionable thing um, that we could invite the listeners to do um, to help with their connection so they've got something to take away from, from this podcast uh, and then go and implement Ooh. Ooh. Smile. Smile. That's it. Smile at someone. Look them in the eyes. You don't have to be creepy about it. <laughs> you don't have to be creepy about it. Um, but look them in the eyes and smile. And if the confidence, the bravery extends to a good morning, to a high, 
take that, do that. Now I'll say this, I'll say this, like it sounds easy. It sounds easy, but that kind of incidental connection works. And some very smart people at the University of British Columbia in Canada ran a study, which essentially was a greeting. Someone from the study walked up to a random person or not walked up to them, but like they passed in a creepy way, but they walked past at uni. And the person in the study said to the other person, to the subject, hi, how are you going? May or may not have paid them a compliment, a non-creepy compliment, but like acknowledge them. And then someone else from the study went up to the person who was said hello to and asked them how they felt. Explained why and what was happening, but asked them how they felt. And what that study said was that the person saying hello got a connection boost, the person receiving the hello got a connection boost, and the people witnessing who weren't involved, who weren't being talked to, they got a connection boost too. So say hello. Or smile. Smile. And allow yourself to get that connection boost. Such good advice. Such good advice. I, I certainly wasn't expecting it to uh, to wrap up that powerfully. <laughs> Here for a peep. Can't turn that off. That's <laughs> uh, fantastic. And, you know, given that uh, that we are a, a social enterprise, if you've enjoyed listening um, today and uh, you, you've got something out of this and you'd like to, to support us, you'd like to get involved, you know, we're open for sponsorships. We're open for uh, for, for guests jumping on and, uh, and, and uh, continuing the conversation. Uh, that uh, that we're having here at Humans Connecting. So by all means, if you would like to to support us, uh, reach out. We're, we're here for it, just like we're here for your connection. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, that was a really enjoyable conversation, Phil. I know that we have some very good chats uh, outside of this, but it was um, as nerve-wracking as it was to, <laughs> to hit record and uh, and start exploring this. Uh, I can I can speak personally and say that uh, that I got a lot out of uh, the stuff that you were sharing. So thank you for uh, for all of your your words, your wisdom, and uh, and for for what you're doing, what we're doing. Yeah, so. yeah, well caught. Um, thank you, Pete, and uh, I really appreciate the questions from you and the team. Um, uh, listener viewer that was crowdsourced um, uh, those questions were, were crowdsourced and I dare say I didn't know the uh, questions beforehand I deliberately didn't want to because I didn't want this to be sort of fake um, and um, uh, and and Pete I have to say it does feel like some of those questions were ad-libbed as well so well done on you uh, well done to you um, I think we need to talk about you hosting the podcast more. But um, the other <laughs> the other thing um, uh, is that um, yeah, thank you so much for getting past the the awkwardness that would have been like hi viewer, hi listener. Um, you know, this is about me. This is what I think you want to know about me um, and stuff. And like ah, uh, so this is a much more comfortable, natural way of uh, introducing us, introducing me and introducing what we're all doing here and how we, you know, plan to change the world one human at a time. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode and for working through the awkwardness of the first episode. We'd love to hear what you thought about the episode, so feel free to comment on YouTube or through our social media channels. Be sure to check our website, humansconnecting.org, for details of how we can support you, get the connection that you need and deserve, 
And there are also details on our website about how we can help you create your connected workplace where the humans within your workplace can truly thrive. And also, if you're a business and are looking for ways to support humans feel more connected, check the link in the episode description to partner with us. That could be through advertising on future episodes of our podcast or collaborating with us in other ways. All that through the link in the episode description. Thank you again so much for joining us. We can't wait to see you in the next episode. But until then, it's time for you to become an awesomely connected human. We'll see you later.